Hello and welcome to our special series of Green Elephant interviews during March 2021, supporting the annual B Corps Month. B Corporations, or B Corps for short, are businesses that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose. Throughout March, we are chatting with key people in companies which have chosen to certify as B Corps and become a force for good. Today, I've been joined by Michal Chesney from Artfinder. Artfinder's vision is to create a world where art benefits everyone. They're going to do this by making art accessible, affordable and a viable career option for artists. Launched eight years ago. By my reckonings, Artfinder have been a certified B Corporation for just short of two of those years. Michal heads up the operations at Artfinder as CEO, having moved from one type of art uh, as a software developer, which is a form of art, in my opinion, <laughs> to support, <laughs> as a former software developer, um, to supporting a more traditional artistic style, perhaps. Uh, Michal says that we believe that buying art should be as enjoyable as living with art. So welcome to the show, Michal. Welcome, Russell. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. And let's kick off. Why, why is art so important, do you think? Well, it underpins what it means to be human. It is the reflection of our creativity. Um, uh, it's an outlet for putting our thoughts and, and emotions and communicating them in a way that is very often, um, you know, inspires action, entices action or entices mood, inspires ways we feel. So it communicates beyond traditional means. And it's actually one of the first means of communication. You know, if you, yeah. uh, if you look all the way back to uh, prehistoric times, people were communicating by using drawings on, on the cave walls, etc. So it's it's always been there in some shape or form, and we've been able to use it as, 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 cap, as a means of capturing what it means to be human. Oh, I like that. Because, uh, I mean, the art, the art world, let's, let's uh, take it into, you know, the business of, of selling art and uh, can be a bit pretentious. Can I say that? Is that allowed? You can, absolutely. It is very true. And it's, uh, it's an opinion shared by many, many people, including myself. And I'm not your typical art person. I come from a small town in the middle of Poland with no art gallery or a museum and uh, other than a town museum, which uh, shows history rather than anything uh, kind of considered to be art but it's not really been uh, anything that uh, assisted me throughout my, or, or, or was there throughout my childhood. Um, art was always something far away and enjoyed by the rich people. And oh, okay, yeah. I think many, many people still see it that way because very often if you go to an art gallery, especially if it's a posh one, you might not feel welcome. And, and that's something that many people share to this day. And, and yet, there are thousands and thousands of artists who create beautiful, beautiful artworks straight from their hearts and they communicate incredible emotions and, and do beautiful things that can, you know, not only communicate stuff, but also decorate our homes and make yeah. us happier. Um, and uh, those people very often struggle to find means of selling their art. The art world can be not only pretentious, it's full of speculation. And the question is, how do you bring transparency? How do you make that art world a bit more accessible to everyone uh, so that you connect people directly with the artists rather than introducing that aura of mysticism, which is really not, um, not always welcoming. So would, would you say that Art Finder therefore is, is more of a, uh, a broker than an art dealer? I'd, I'd say we are a platform where, where artists and art lovers meet. Um, it's a meeting point. Um, yeah. you know, we call ourselves a marketplace, but ultimately we allow our artists and our customers to talk, uh, to exchange messages, to negotiate, to discuss commissions, 
you know, so if you if you want a painting of your mother painted for her uh, birthday or a big anniversary of your parents' wedding or something like that, you can actually get to uh, speak to an artist and see if they can produce something uh, within their own style uh, and creative freedom, but something that actually will be a unique gift. And we believe deeply that that human connection between an artist and a customer, uh, a collector, or, or just a human being that wants something beautiful in their life is really, really essential in what we, what we are here to enable. Um, because that traditional art world does everything uh, a lot to conceal what what it truly means to be an artist. You know, artists are struggling. Artists yes. are finding it difficult to get by. Um, there are very there are few artists out there that have been extremely successful. They are not really worried about making ends meet. But majority, vast majority of artists are struggling to make a living, and very often the gallerist would not want you to know that because that might perhaps change, you know, make you change your mind about buying their piece. So they don't want you to know that the artist is working as a, as a cashier at Tesco's during the daytime and they produce this piece at nighttime on the weekend. It's not something that really is, is talked about. And, and yet there are lots of artists out there that produce incredible artwork. And yeah. just, they haven't been lucky to know the right person at the right time that would propel their careers into you know, the, the uh, posh galleries of this world. Yeah, and the posh galleries are because uh, very much on the ticket price because they, they need to make a commission, they need to make a, they need to make their money uh, because of, and they've, they've got a venue and they, they've got credentials to maintain and such the like. And there's a lot of opinion in art is now. I mean, art is, if nothing else, art is in the eye of the beholder. It is very subjective indeed. And, you know, the difference as well is that on Artfinder people um, or artists who are obviously the creators of the work, yeah. they set their own prices. We don't dictate prices, which is typically in the traditional gallery system, the gallerist will very often inflate the price uh, yeah. because that's, you know, they are there to kind of uh, drive that sale, etc. We enable artists to set their own rules and we are 100% transparent about what pieces sell for. Uh, it's not something that happens often in galleries. No, that's it's an interesting element, transparency, because obviously an element uh, that perhaps drew you to B Corps. Yes, I think B Corps will very often value transparency as, as one of the core principles or core, core um, ethical, moral, compass um, um, elements. And I think that's really important because transparency helps people to trust one another. If you're open with, uh, with your yeah. artists, with your customers about what really goes on, then you can try and you can work towards building that trust. And again, looking at the art world, artists are very often um, um, distrusting of the venues that are selling their art and rightly so because there's a lot of people that are trying to make money off them yeah and it's very often galleries will not pay artists on time or they will ask them to pay for more than was what was agreed before so there's just a lot of kind of um trust to be rebuilt and you know i don't think we can do that without being transparent about where where the money goes and how the business operates because ultimately we also charge a commission it's not the lowest commission on the market uh, but we charge what we have to charge in order to pay the bills and keep yeah. the lights on and make sure that we're also able to invest in research and development and actually progress this platform forward i mean it's your your stats are are impressive we've got a 10,000 it says on your site you've got 10,000 artists selling on on art finder and it's growing every day and fifteen thousand new artworks added every month i mean that's that's a, that's a colossal um amount of art how do you curate yes. that into the eyes to the eyes of the right people so we've got we've got entry criteria uh which are public and they are open to everyone uh, to see so we kind of changed the system a little bit in the sense that 
if you want to join ArtFinder, it's not necessarily, you know, a black box. You don't know what the criteria are. No. And there's someone sitting in some room deciding uh, who's in and who's out. It's actually very clear what we are looking for in artist applications. It's all about being able to present uh, to a certain degree that you're serious about what you're creating, that you're able to produce works that people will want to buy because we are a platform for enabling that buy, uh, yeah. buying process to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, very people, many people create art but are not necessarily able to, uh, to, to take that step to make it a bit more commercial, to make it a bit more desirable as an item for people to buy. And I think this is one of the key criteria that we have on our platform, which is we expect us, because at the moment we don't have the resources to necessarily take artists who are at the entry stage yeah. and teach them how to become more commercial. At the moment, this is our dream. We want to get yeah. to that point where we are also welcoming artists on a lower level or not a lower level, at the beginning of their career, so to speak, um, um, lower level of their commercial ability yeah. and help them increase that commercial ability, increase the, um, the awareness of how to package it in a way that the modern consumer will actually want to look at because you know let's be real um, artists these days compete with the likes of Ikea whether they like it or not you know whether they like it or not for an average person on the high street that doesn't really understand art you know and doesn't know that they can very often buy a beautiful piece of art from an artist that is perhaps living in a country with lower lower wages. So they are able to purchase a beautiful painting or a beautiful print for the price of an Ikea print. And, you know, so, so therefore artists have to be a bit more commercially driven or at least have the drive to learn how to sell online. And yes, we're working very, very hard to help artists get there. At the moment, um, we've got comprehensive education, um, on our knowledge base, but I think we've got a much longer way to go in terms of producing those materials so artists are on all levels can actually join and, and have success on ArtFinder. I, I suppose you also could be enticing people that hadn't thought their art was potentially saleable, but you know, the other people looking at it, oh, you should try sailing that, and they go, oh, no, I can't, I can't get my head around the commerce. So, so the, the, uh, the idea I hopefully would be to get even those encouraged perhaps to sell their art. Yes, because the market is changing. Again, what is taught in art schools isn't necessarily um, taking into account that the art world has been moving and is moving and it will continue to move online. So therefore there are different elements that become important in the way the art is presented and packaged and shipped. Yes. Yeah. Previously you were just drop it off at the gallery and the galleries would do all the work of packing and shipping. And now artists have to find their own channel. And there's also a, a, you know, a huge number of sales that happen directly between uh, artists and customers on platforms like Instagram or Facebook, of yeah. course. So I think the art world is changing. Um, the, the, the big galleries and the big auction houses are doing their best to modernize and to take advantage of these trends. Um, and I think there's a room for many different players and for many different, uh, uh, you know, types of consumers or customers, there will be different service that various companies can provide. You know, our mission is to create, a, or our vision is to create a world where art um, benefits everyone, not just the lucky few. And yeah. that's, the, that's the goal of Art Finder. And I therefore hope that as we grow, we can welcome more and more artists um, you know, at the heart of everything that we do is is an idea of fairness and trying to give artists as much and as equal exposure as possible. We're investing in making sure that um, that experience is personalized because art is really subjective. So what you will like, Russell, is very different for, to what I might like. Yeah. Although I do like the pieces that I can see behind you. Uh, <laughs> so there might be some common common elements. So the the, 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 because art is so subjective, there's no point in showing the same piece of art to every visitor of our website. You know, we need to tailor that experience. And therefore, 
by tailoring to the audience, yeah. they can provide exposure to a broader uh, number of artists and, and their works. Yeah, and I, I, what I enjoyed about the site on going through it is that you know, you've got a range of different things. You've got everything from printmaking to digital art, from the traditional, perhaps what you think to see on an art, art site would be paintings, but you've got the drawings and the and the sculptures as well. And I think that it, it, it's people forget what, well, perhaps forget the range of art that's that's there. Have is the sustainability of the art itself coming to the fore as well? I stuff uh, collages perhaps made out of um, recycled or, or gathered materials or um, you know anything that that perhaps could be uh, have a more ecological bent. There is um, a lot of that on our website. I think that uh, the challenge we've got is is when artists are listing their artworks on the site, they're already answering tons of questions about the style, the, the subject, the category, the, the sizing, etc. And there is a balance to be struck in terms of what you kind of ask on those forms. So to, to, to be completely honest, we don't collect this sort of information, but we anecdotally, as we curate, as we see what's being uploaded, there's a lot of art that takes into account sensitivities around sustainability. We survey our artists as a big corporation every year to try and measure our impact. And in fact, we do know that vast majority of our artists do deeply care about sustainability and, and they produce their art with sustainability in mind. So okay. there's a lot of uh, effort going into selection of the right canvases that they are made from you know, FSC certified frames, etc. So th there's a lot that goes on. And because we deal with the makers, with artists, with people who have that sensitivity, we actually do know that a lot of the work that we sell is made sustainably to an extent that it can be made sustainably because obviously not every oil paint will be made sustainably. Um, there is a lot of work to be done in that uh, in that uh, aspect. I must admit, for sure. It's, it's like uh, it's a good point. I mean, like so many things, there's some some things that that ha you know, if you're going to do a wood sculpture, it's difficult to do that a secondhand wood and, and get the right piece and the right knots yes. and the right color and the right grain and everything like that. And it would be really, um, you know, you don't want to limit art because of sustainability but perhaps you need to it needs to be sensitive to it all the ways because otherwise we're in the danger of saying oh you can't use oils because that comes from petroleum yes absolutely i think artists are gen again you can't generalize because we're all human we're all different but i would say you know talking to our artists um engaging with them on our seller forum um, or even chatting to them when we uh, organized the climate change art prize together with Octopus Energy um, about a year ago. Uh, we, we know that the subject is extremely close to their heart and yeah. many of them are wanting to talk about it and they talk about it in their pieces. So I think there is a conversation going on and I think we are at the beginning of that transition as in many industries, you know, art is no different. It is more of a, you know, mentally and con consciousness wise, I think artists are ahead of some of the other industries by a mile. Well, the, and it's just yeah. more about how, you know, can you even source some of those materials responsibly? That's a different question. Yeah, and uh, uh, the majority of art draws upon nature in itself. So, I mean, if you're looking on nature yes. in, in despair or looking on nature with delight, it's, it's, you know, depending on your perspective, it's, it's still a view on nature, isn't it? More often than not. True, um, yes. So, so I'm just going back on that a bit. The, the, do you therefore treat your, your artists like your supply chain, I suppose, as they kind of it's, are? I think it's very... Um... I, I think it dehumanizes that kind of, I don't like that word. Oh yeah, good point. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, our artists are the creators of, of the works that happen to be available 
to purchase on our site, but ultimately um, we see them as partners and they are also our in investors because we've recently closed a crowdfunding ground where hundreds that. of our artists have participated. So they co-own the business. And in some way, you know, our dream is to create a platform that works for them and works for the consumers. People yeah, who want to actually live with the art, want to collect it, want to buy it, um, or just ab admire it because also you don't have to have the budget to buy art in order to use ArtFinder. You can still create your virt virtual collection and you can still send artists words of appreciation, which who doesn't like that? So, but in some way we treat them as, we are seeing them as our community and we work with our community um, to help them um, become more sustainable. We are staring that conversation. There's a lot that we need to do still, but we have started doing some bits that I'm very proud of. So last year we, um, we started planting trees for every artwork that is sold through ArtFinder. To date we've planted, we fund the planting of 25,000 trees and uh, that's just the beginning uh, of our sustainability journey. Uh, every year as a B Corp, as you know, uh, we need to release a impact report, yep. um, annual impact report, where you outline your road to that sustainability and your impact to date. So um, one of the areas that I really want us to tackle this year is something that we committed to tackling last year, but then COVID happened which is to truly assess the impact of the entire operation, including the community's, you know, creation of art and shipment of art. Wow. And that's not something that is easy to do when you're a small business. No. Um, a, yeah, to be honest, yeah. with the breadth of, of your community, it wouldn't be easy to do for a big business, I don't think. So, yeah. It is, it is complex because it's not that you have one manufacturer that you can talk to and assess their processes. You've got a community and we've got, you know, thousands of artists in over hundred countries and uh, the practices will differ from country to country. You know, you might be able to buy hundred percent sustainable organic, um, uh, you know, FSC certified canvases in the UK and Europe and America, but it might be harder to buy that if you're an artist in China or in Thailand. So we just need to take that into account. Uh, I think the platform has the obligation to do more that artists can't easily do. And one big area that we're looking at as well, this and next year is the logistics, is to make sure that we are doing more to help artists ship using more responsible ways and, um, and providers and also offset the carbon from all the shipments. But this is something that, again, we're at the beginning of that journey. Um, uh, well, I mean, uh, hats off, and uh, I would encourage anybody to go have a look at your website and just cruise around and have a look at. I'm looking at the sculptures page at the moment, and I'm fascinated with this clay sculpture by Cecil Kemper, Kemperink. Fantastic thing, and and it is a, a piece of beauty. Now, thinking it um, uh, about a thing of beauty, um, <laughs> I'm not referring to myself, but B Corps. Um, we're here to, to to talk about B Corps Month, and uh, uh, why did the company choose B Corps as as something to aim for? I think Artfinder has always been a B Corp at the heart, <laughs> uh, with the mission of helping artists make a living and actually transforming a market that is fundamentally, you know, by many people seen as broken. I think that's been always at the heart of what we wanted to do. When I learned what the B Corp movement is about, it was like, this is it. We need to become a certified B Corporation. It's a wonderful, wonderful way of deriving common vocabulary about how to talk about sustainability, how to transform a business so that it doesn't really care just about making profit, but actually doing something good in this world, because mm -hmm. that should be the purpose of the existence of every business. Every business should exist for doing something good in this world. A purpose, um, and, yeah. we, yeah. and we are backing, you know, B Labs um, um, campaign for Better Business Act, which yep. is trying to uh, do exactly that, which is, uh, you know, make all businesses uh, legally 
uh, having to consider not just the, uh, you know, making profit, but actually looking after its people and looking after the communities and the environment, because every business should be a good citizen of this world, not just the B Corps. A uh, great, great sale, sales pitch for the Better Business Act as, as something that obviously doesn't, is yet to be enshrined in law and something that we'll be campaigning on. Uh, I'll, I'll be speaking to uh, Bates Wells, who helped draft that uh, act for B Corp. So looking forward to, to that interview as well. Becoming certified, is, is it easy? It is um transformative i would say ah, it is nice. yeah uh, i think like anything worth having is challenging i think it's not something that comes uh easy because you have to divert attention from the day-to-day -day. you have to divert attention from running the business and 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 uh, you know looking at sales and things and with a small team for us it, was challenging, but it was also reinvigorating. It really helped us look, it's like a look in the mirror. You look in the mirror and you really are able to see, not just, you know, actually, you know, looking good today, but actually also there are some flaws that we need to fix. You know, there is a little bit of uh, uh, things that we need to yeah. fix here. Or, <laughs> you know, what, it's not even about brushing up, but it's you know, the assessment process which is free to take by anyone online. You don't need to be a B Corp or even aspire to be one. You can just do the assessment for the fun of it. It <laughs> just asks, it asks a lot of questions that are really, really helpful in assessing your own business practices and begins to ignite some sort of flame of, you know, I actually want to do something in this area. I haven't thought of this area yet the B impact assessment is helping to discover those areas that you might be deep down very, very passionate about, but because of the running and constant, you know, focus mm. on the day-to-day -day operation, you might have forgotten. So yeah. in our case, it was transformative because it really helped me and the team. You know, I've been with the business for eight years and you can just get lost in running of the business. But yep. when you reconnect with that purpose, when you reconnect with doing something good in the world, it just brings that joy back to, to work, to, to doing something in this world. Not just for me as a business leader, but to my entire team. Wow. I mean, uh, that's the, uh, the, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are running businesses out there that find it a little bit of a joyless pursuit. And so that's an interesting um, yeah, interesting concept to bring joy back to your business perhaps to give, help you realize where you started it will give re, re, reignite your purpose maybe I like that lovely yes so it, I mean probably you kind of answered this but I'll ask it anyway can you put a finger on why you value the B Corps as a as a movement or is it what element of it do you value or why I think the most appealing thing for me is the fact that they start with the purpose rather than uh, well let me rephrase that what i really truly value in b Corps is that they start with a purpose that is not making money it is making a difference in this world and it's not you don't need to be running a business that is uh, specifically planting trees or specifically, uh, you know, sucking out carbon out of the air. You can run a business that is a law firm or is a, uh, you know, a hair salon, but you mm. can become a B Corp because mm. it is all about doing something good in this world because people do need legal services, but you can provide them differently. People do need a haircut, but you can provide it differently with, you know, actually supporting local environments or providing apprenticeship schemes to, to local kids. And this is what's really, really important is starting with purpose and also being put on that um, journey of constant self-improvement as a business, because that's what B Corp movement does. It's not just a one of stamp that you get. Yeah. You actually have to continuously improve, continuously through the impact report, 
through measurement of your own, um, you know, the effect that you're having on, on the environment, on the society, etc. You actually have to, I keep, you keep identifying those things that you can do next, which makes yeah. it a, a very different endeavor than just focusing on sales targets and, and uh, you know, the next, uh, the yeah. next uh, uh, tax year or whatever, <laughs> financial yeah. year. Yeah, no, I, I, I really appreciate that. And it, although I do like the aspect also that although you focus on purpose and you're switching your view perhaps more to people and planet, Profit is not a dirty word. You know, you have to, yeah. I mean, you have to, the business needs to be sustainable. So the sustainability of a B Corp is not just about, you have to have a business if you want to make a difference. I, if you're not able to sustain the business, then of course you can't pay people salary so they can't do any good, you know? Well, at least not in this business. No. Um, so you need to find a good balance. And I think that is, um, ultimately that kind of magic trick of B Corps is marrying the, you know, being a good citizen of this world, uh, providing that purpose to um, everyone that is engaged with the business in any way, but at the same time doing something good that is measurable uh, rather than just having it plastered on your office wall as a, here are the things that we believe in. It's like, are you actually doing those things? That's a different story. So, I mean, rounding that out, you you, um, you you enjoy you've enjoyed reinventing your organisation. Indeed, indeed, I, and it's a it's a recommendation that I, I brought to this uh, uh, um, recording today uh, with you. It's a, it's a, it's actually a book called Reinventing Organisations, which talks about. Um, I might be jumping ahead. Uh, no, no, you little, carry on. But it is indeed the thing that I I love about observing how we work as human beings. You know, because everyone wants to be engaged in something that is meaningful and purposeful. We, yeah, you know, very often people work for companies for the money because they have to pay the bills. But of course, any person any day would change that for something that they can do that also brings them money but actually is a meaningful and purposeful thing. Connect them with you know, what it means to be human, um, actually making a difference in other people's lives. Yeah. And, and that's what being a B Corp actually brings to the team. It really connects everyone with doing what the business is meant to do. Uh, whatever the business's mission and, and vision is, yeah. it will change from business to business, but ultimately, you're not focusing on sales targets and hitting goals and things like that. It's actually, yes, you might still have goals, but they will be goals that are related to, to doing something meaningful. Yeah. So just repeat that recommendation for us. So we're, we're clear on it. What was the name of the book? So I was thinking of two books, but this is less relevant for the, um, this one is less relevant for the podcast, obviously, but reinventing organizations is actually also a title of a book. Yes, uh, that I'm very fascinated about. Just picked about. it up here. It's by by Frederick Lou. That That's the one? right. That's right. So I, I'm I'm fascinated by the subject of reinventing organizations because it helps to discover how can you bring the best in people uh, that you hire and that you work with. And as I mentioned earlier, being a B Corp means that you invite people to make a difference to actually. Yes you know roll up their sleeves and do something meaningful every day it's not about imposing restrictions and rules and processes it's more about unleashing everyone's potential and and uh i love the subject it's something that's very very close to my heart and i think b corps do it really well yeah well what we'll do is we'll take that as your your uh your organizational um recommendation i'm going to ask you for Indeed. a second one in a minute so perhaps before we go on to your your real recommendation we'll we'll talk about what tips or actions you can uh, uh, suggest that people go and do themselves i think there is lots we can do today but one particular thing that came to my mind um is um, to subscribe to a platform that helps you offset your uh, emissions and perhaps even plant some trees so i personally subscribe to ecologic 
which is um, a wonderful uh, B Corp pending uh, social enterprise that is allowing you to subscribe just as easily as you subscribe, I don't know, for your music subscriptions or video subscriptions yeah. and pay a small fee to offset your carbon emissions and plant some trees. You can add to your forest um, at any point in time. And they offer also beautiful gifts and that you can give to people that you love um, that are very different. So you can give a hundred trees instead of giving someone a piece of, um, you know, thing that they might not necessarily enjoy as much. And I think it's, it's, it's really, really a beautiful thing. You don't feel it monthly, you know, if, if you're paying, paying five quid, but it actually makes a big difference to the world long-term. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I'll, we'll put links to ecology um, uh, and tree planting and offsetting. It's, it's an interesting subject to say the least, um, but we'll put that link up. So onto your proper recommendation um, uh, for, the t for today, and we'll, we'll accept two recommendations in this particular episode, but what have you got for us to, to read? Sure. So there you go. Uh, and forgive my confusion, but um, <laughs> so the, the recommendation I brought today is the good ancestor, how to think in the long term, uh, in, how to think long term in a short term world by Roman Knaritz, which I hope I pronounce well. well um, number, so, so with a person with a name like your own, it's good to hear you struggling. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I am struggling with this one. Um, although I do have also four consonants in my surname. <laughs> um, I, you know, the book itself is, is, is really helping to get that perspective on what it means to think long-term. And very often we think long-term about maybe taking on a university course or taking on a mortgage or things like that are probably the longest term things. Longest and term. Maybe having kids. Um, but typically we go uh, maybe years or tens of years, a few decades ahead, but rarely much beyond. But the book really invites you and gives some practical techniques on how you can connect with the idea of being the good ancestor. Um, so really connecting with the generations that were before us, but also the generations that are to come after us. And, um, you know, it is a wonderful um, way to think about our lives is how do we want to be remembered? How do we want to make a difference in this world? Um, and I love how Roman um, kind of describes those different techniques. And there's lots of projects that are also truly inspirational to, to, uh, to know about um, uh, from this book um, or things like seventh generation decision-making that is used in certain areas of the world um, to kind of, you know, they, they combine people uh, representing, uh, you know, people of today with people do, who are assigned roles of representing the uh, citizens of the seventh generation. And therefore assessing things like projects in a city is done by two groups. One group is making sure that the projects and, and, and things that they are discussing are addressing issues of today's population, but actually those people that are asked to um, represent the interests of the seventh generation, they are actually there to help ensure that the project is going to deliver benefits, not just for today, but actually for the long term. And it's just lots of techniques like this in, described in the book. I'm still kind of about halfway through, but I'm fascinated by the idea and I think it's a, it's a wonderful subject to explore, um, to help look at how businesses can look beyond that next year financial planning type thing, but actually have an impact, uh, you know, into future generations. Yeah, I, I can imagine going to the bank with a, a business plan which stretched off for, uh, <laughs> for a couple hundred years. That'd be quite interesting. <laughs> That's the problem because banks would would very often laugh at you at, at this yeah. stage. So it's yeah. it's it's a challenge that I think we all um, have as humans. But we, as a species, I think we've got that beautiful capacity to think in an abstract way. Yeah, Again, yeah. linking back to art, and you know, we can imagine worlds um, 
of the future and you know they could look differently but the the the, the challenge is how do you bring a little bit of that forward thinking into a world which is extremely focused on the short term and instant grat gratification and, and returns tomorrow and things like that. Yeah. So the yeah. change has to come from everyone, from okay. everyone, you know, from consumers, from businesses, from investment um, vehicles, banks. And this is the only way we can really tackle some of those issues that, you know, they, they, they suffer when we focus on the short term. The, the environment is, is clearly being stretched to its limits and it's not going to um, take much, much more time uh, for us to um, induce irreversible damage. Uh, damage. Yeah, this is true. Well, thank you for that. Um, I understand that you have some fact or fakes to sh serve up to me for my uh, for my misery. Yes. <laughs> so yes. go for and it. I, I I kind of revealed one already, but you know it's a, it's a, it's linking to what we talked earlier. Um, so is this a fact or a fake? Um, artists do not think about sustainability in art that they create. I think, I think, uh, yeah, on the basis of what you said, but I think anyway, I would have said that's a fake because I think people are in touch with that. Indeed, you're well done. In fact, according to our impact surveys, well over 80% of artists surveyed said oh. that they think about it. Um, and actually 60% think of it much more um, than they have uh, thought of before. Okay. Although 20 have always had it at the heart of what they do, 20%. That's great. So uh, another one is not art related, uh, yeah. but majority of green credential claims published on the sites of major retailers are true and valid. <laughs> uh, uh, say that one again majority of green credential claims published on the sites of retailers are true and valid well um i think i can by my laughter i would have to say fake on that one as well indeed it is yeah. a fake uh in fact 89 percent of claims are not true they are not yeah. honest. Or right. I'm not. According the to a recent study. <laughs> yes, that's the ultimate greenwashing. Um, yes. That's... Wow. Okay. Thank you. I'm winning. Yay. Well done. Uh, so I guess over to you to give me some. Okay. I'll got a few more then. Um, art used to be an Olympic event. Ooh. Is that a fact or is that a fake? It's a fake. It's a fact. Between, oh. 19, between 1912 and 1948, medals were given out for sporting inspired masterpieces of architecture, music, painting, sculpture and literature. That's fantastic. How did they miss that? Oh, maybe I wasn't alive back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you weren't alive. Definitely. I wasn't alive. Um, but yeah, I found that super interesting. Amazing. Um, here we go. Here's an interesting one. I, I, I did. I didn't want to go wholly down sustainable because I found some of the facts so fascinating that I found by accident. So artist Willard Wigan ate his own work of art called Alice in Wonderland. Oof. So I guess it is a fact. <laughs> I have no idea. It's fair uh, enough. And, and I would forgive you because I'd never heard of Willard Wigan anyway. Um, but he makes micro sculptures, ones you have to look at a microscope through on yes. the head of a pin, that kind of stuff. Um, okay. And he has to learn to slow his heartbeat and breathe properly. So he inhaled his heart work. <laughs> <sighs> oh, wow. That's fascinating. So I not thought, quite eaten it absorbed it <laughs> he just breathed it in but it just took a breath breath in it's, it's gone uh, there's it's nothing a, he could a, do it's a, it's a new meaning to absorbing art <laughs> <laughs> yes um and it, i'll finally one this to see i i did do three um pablo picasso 
was many things during his prolific pr career, painter, sculptor and playwright, but he also stole the Mona Lisa in August 1911. Is that Ooh. a fact or a fake? I think I, I'm guessing it's a fake. You seen through my ruse on that occasion, um, but it was stolen in 1911 um, from the Louvre. Uh, eight days later, uh, a guy called Joseph Perret uh, revealed that Picasso and his friend were in possession of some sculptures that had also been stolen. And Picasso was then the lead yeah. suspect in the theft of the Mona Lisa. Fortunately for... <laughs> Fortunately for him, it was recovered in December 2013, so they lost it for over two years uh, when it found it turned up in Florence in Italy, which is probably where it was done in the first place, funnily enough. So uh, I just thought that was amazing that the poor, <laughs> poor chap lived under a cloud for two years for stealing one of the most famous pieces wow. of art. <laughs> Great well, stuff. Uh, that was brilliant fun. I, I do thank you very much, Michal, uh, for thank that, you. for the time. And uh, I'll accept that uh, that win with grace uh, and uh, and will not hold it against you because I think art is such a vast subject. It's almost cruel to ask people questions about it. I also never claim I have all the answers. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably a good move. I have to claim that quite regularly. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. We really hope that you found this special B Court Month episode both informative and entertaining. Make sure you don't miss any of the 31 interviews with B Corporations who are striving to be a force for good. So make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a thing. And don't forget to spread the word with others. If you have any questions about being or becoming a B Corp or any comments and suggestions about the show, please do get in touch. You can email studio at greenelephant.show or visit the website greenelephant.show or find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube or Twitter by searching for Green Elipod or The Green Elephant Show. You can also review the show on Google and Apple Podcasts. Join us tomorrow and we hope you have a sustainable day.